Episode of RC3 Talks here on Chaos Zone TV. Chaos Zone is the collection or collective of all the hacker communities here in Eastern Germany. And we are presenting you today Hacking Google Maps by Simon Weckert and Moritz Allert. Um, this talk will be in English, so I will quickly jump to German to announce the translation. Dieser Vortrag wird live übersetzt. Wenn ihr ihn live sehen wollt, ähm, übersetzt nach Deutsch, dann klickt unten rechts in eurem Videoplayer auf Translation 1. Now back to English and back to the talk Hacking Google Maps by Simon Beckert and Moritz Allert. Have a lot of fun. This is our RC3 submission called Hacking Google Maps by Simon Weckert and Moritz Allert. Simon Weckert is an artist with his home base in Berlin. He likes to share knowledge on a wide range of fields from generative design to physical computing. His focus is the digital world, including everything related to code and electronics under the reflection on current social aspects, ranging from technology-oriented examinations to the discussion of current social issues. In his work, he seeks to assess the value of technology, not in terms of actual utility, but from the perspective of future generations. He wants to raise awareness of the privileged state in which people live within Western civilization and remind them of the obligations attached to this privilege. Hidden layers like producing and transporting the raw minerals required to create the core infrastructure of technology and human fold automation labor of micro-workers who perform the repetitive digital tasks that underlie new technology are just some of the topics in his projects. Moritz Allert is researcher and artist based in Berlin. He studied architecture in Hanover and the Berlin University of the Arts. In his work he explores the interface between actor-based urban design, mapping and digitalization of cities. He is the author of several publications and he exhibited internationally. From 2015 to 2017 he was part of a three-year graduate program, to research the aesthetics of the virtual at HFBK Hamburg and was working towards a PhD in art. He defended his dissertation last year. Since 2017 he is a researcher and lecturer at the Habitat Unit, Chair of International Urbanism and Design at TU Berlin. Recent teaching activities include the Atlas of Digital Fragments analyzing the global appropriation of digital tools by civil society actors in an international context. The format of our RC3 submission is a video essay, based on an essay by Moritz Salat with two interventions by Simon Weckert. The essay by Moritz Salat discusses the technical development of maps and their function within society. It links the genesis of early maps with the current development of urban apps and the success of Pokemon Go. Thus it questions the practice of mapping and gives an overview over the critical perspectives of today's mapping. The two interventions by Simon Weckert are Google Maps borders a research. Focusing on the virtual border regime of Google Maps and second the Google Maps hack, and performance and intervention which went viral in the beginning of this year. Maps have always been instrument of power. They have always been a significant instrument of government and domination. In antiquity, in the Middle Ages, and in the modern age alike, rulers have used maps to further their political agenda and to enforce their sovereign power. Maps are proven instruments for reflecting statistical data, and the history of the map is therefore also closely associated with the founding of nation-states. In the mid-18th century, the nation-state took a growing interest in measuring its own territories, and in surveying its population. With its topographical divisions into states, these became the main protagonists in cartography. By providing iconographic national outlines, maps increased identification with a nation-state, thus allowing geopolitical borders to become fixed in people's minds. Maps served as instruments of military defense, in military campaigns and in propagandizing national identities. 
until only a few decades ago, maps were exclusively produced by nation-states, frequently in a military context. The map is and was an instrument of disciplinary and sovereign power, as Foucault would have defined it. From the late 1980 onwards authors like John B. Harley, Dennis Wood, and Jeremy Crampton have taken a critical look at the ways in which maps function, and have explored the current perception of maps. They have come to the conclusion that maps are not objective, neutral graphic representations that endeavor to reflect the real world as accurately as possible. Instead, cartography is governed by rules that are scarcely questioned. Formalisms such as simplifying, distorting, secrecy, centralizing and hierarchizing have always been determining factors in cartographic praxis. A particularly interesting and tension-filled relationship between power and counter-power can be noted in the maps produced by the transnational corporation Google. This poses a question, how are power relationships expressed in the cartographic praxis and representation of Google Maps specifically, in terms of the previously mentioned strategies of simplifying, centralizing and hierarchizing? The advent of Google's GeoTools began in 2005 with Maps and Earth followed by Street View in 2007. They have since become enormously more technologically advanced. Google's virtual maps have little in common with classical analog maps. The most significant difference is that Google's maps are interactive, scrollable, searchable and zoomable. Google's map service has fundamentally changed our understanding of what a map is, how we interact with maps, their technological limitations, and how they look aesthetically. Thanks to Google, maps are more ubiquitous today than ever before, and, with the widespread use of smartphones, are influencing users' patterns of behavior. By using maps as a form of synaptic real-time networking, smart digital devices are creating a novel form of hyperlocality, a situation in which things and users are interconnected and can be localized, and in which the physical world fuses with the virtual world. Google's GeoTools have become the nerve center and logbook of this world order. Um, I think when we think about maps, then we always have to think about how maps have been used, especially back in the days, um, as an instrument of power and as an instrument of control and an instrument to argue, to shape and to define areas, to um, basically take a liner and a pen and then, like, like we see it um, here on this map, to um, say okay this is my part this is your part or also when we're talking about conversation how people have been divided by by those maps and have been used as an argument to split them and um so it means that maps are like such a powerful such a such a strong let's say a tool and instrument to um to represent a specific worldview and of course to also to make politics with it and um so as we know it, maps can be, for example, um, well, can draw borders, for example, but they can also um, use another specific, um, let's say, graphic, um, yeah, let's say, tool in a of graphic, other graphic um, symbols like, like a circle for a city, or let's say, like a, I don't know, let's say, black line for a street, or something like for representation for river, right? And these kind of graphical sets, they are also representing some kind of generalizations. So, 
when we see a map, then we always have to think about this is really just a generalized point of view. This is not the real world, it's really just representation, but there can be so many other different um, points of views about this area, what we're seeing there. So that's always, I think, I think what we should not forget. And when, when we see a map, that's really, that can be never seen as the real world. It's really just representation of the real world. And, um, well, you know, think about, like, I guess, Mercator projection, where we always give them some kind of, it's like a super central, um, Europe central map. I think most, most of the people in Germany um, learn it in the school, that they see this kind of projection and therefore they also give them like Europe a much more, let's say, importantness in this map because uh, Europe is in that sense much more a place in the center. But there are so many different, uh, let's say, versions and variations how you can present the, the, the world map. So I think that we should always um, have this in mind and how um, well how maps can be used for some kind of political statements or some kind of political um, um, well let's say motivations um, uh, can be seen here in this project which i did um, last year that's so called uh, google maps borders so i was writing a kind of algorithm to scan um, um, google maps on their, let's say, borders um, of their countries. And you have to know that there are different Google Maps, uh, let's say, versions. So basically, there is like a Google Maps um, Ukraine, there's a Google Maps France, there's a Google Maps um, Russia, there's a Google Maps India and um, US and, and so on. And um, I was interested in if Google is showing us um, um, the same information when we're going to use the different Google Maps versions. And what I found was that it's not like this. So what you can see, for example, on the top is the, on the left side, you see um, Google Maps India on, and on the right side, you see Google Maps China. And especially for the Kashmir region there, you can definitely see that the borders are different. So of course, we know that's like an old conflict between the two countries and it's still in a way um, not, not somehow, let's say, 100% clear how they're going to deal with it, and it's always like this kind of forward backward process. But I think what's important here is to see that um, Google is kind of, you know, standing behind the local opinion of this country, and, and I think I would say that they are also, in a way, trying to not lose the local market of online map services in this country there when they are not, um, in the sense, um, representing the, the local opinion. And here I would say they are definitely. Um, making politics and they are not uh, dealing in a neutral way in, um, um, in with, with their maps how the way how it should be so same thing for example is here on, on the bottom like when you see um, google maps russia and google maps ukraine and we all remember the um, 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 an action of the um, Krim island or the Krim um, between russia and and ukraine and on the left side, you see that the border between um, Ukraine and uh, the Krim Island is like a, basically like a, yeah, like a line and it's definitely saying, okay, this island belongs to Russia. But when you see it on the Ukraine side, then suddenly it's like a stroke line and the, the state is somehow unclear. So this definitely for me represents some point of some, some world views and, um, and it creates actually uh, some kind of imbalance between what kind of information we are getting with regards to where we are coming from and then it's quite hard for us, to, I would say, to, uh, to come to a common sense when we are getting different arguments, when we are getting different information by those tools. At an early stage, Google put in place specialized programming interfaces called APIs which allowed the programmers of other web tools to combine their data with Google Maps and to geo-reference it, known as map mashups. It was the opportunity offered by the mashups that first made possible the emergence of new economic models, such as large parts of the digital shared or gig economies. In this fashion, Google Maps makes virtual changes to the real city. Applications such as Airbnb and car sharing have an immense impact on cities, on their housing market and mobility culture, for instance. There is also a major impact on how we find a romantic partner, thanks to dating platforms such as Tinder, and on our self-quantifying behavior, thanks to the Nike jogging app, or map-based food delivery app like Deliveroo or Foodora. All of these apps function via interfaces with Google Maps and create new forms of digital capitalism and commodification. 
Without these maps, car sharing systems, new taxi apps, bike rental systems and online transport agency services such as Uber would be unthinkable. An additional mapping market is provided by self-driving cars, again, Google has already established a position for itself. As mentioned Google Maps has led to novel displacements and overlapping of physical and virtual spaces. In this context, simulation techniques are used not only to generate virtual worlds, but to form realities and to intervene in physical spaces. We can safely say that digitalization has opened up the mapping sector, which was once dominated by the state. Instead of leading to increased democratization, this has resulted in fragmentations. Economic interests appear to have replaced state and military interests. Google uses its maps to open up new markets, to collect more data and to profit from the online platforms which use Google Maps as their basis. With its Geo tools, Google has created a platform that allows users and businesses to interact with maps in a novel way. This means that questions relating to power in the discourse of cartography have to be reformulated. But what is the relationship between the art of enabling and techniques of supervision, control and regulation in Google's maps? Do these maps function as dispositive nets that determine the behavior, opinions and images of living beings, exercising power and controlling knowledge? Maps, which themselves are the product of a combination of states of knowledge and states of power, have an inscribed power dispositive. Google's simulation-based map and world models determine the actuality and perception of physical spaces and the development of action models. To echo the words of Agamben, today, it seems that there is not a single instant in the life of an individual that cannot be formed, contaminated, ordered or controlled by dispositives, in the form of maps. Deleuze writes, in the societies of control, it is no longer either a signature or a number that is important, but a code, the code is a password. Individuals have become individuals, masses, samples, data, markets, or banks. He cites Guattari's vision in which a individual map becomes the control material. Felix Guattari has imagined a city where one would be able to leave one's apartment, one's street, one's neighborhood thanks to one's individual electronic map that raises a given barrier, but the map could just as easily be rejected on a given day or between certain hours. What counts is not the barrier but the computer that tracks each person's position, licit or illicit, and affects a universal modulation. The digital map of today is an instrument of the surveillance and control dispositive described by Deleuze and Guattari. Every click on the net, every step in space is recorded and registered. Everything that moves around, goods, information, communication, capital, and consumers, is tracked. According to Zygmunt Bauman, every human being is a wandering hyperlink. The digital map co-writes tabulates, and increasingly removes the blank spaces of our private life. The everyday negotiations of our lives are cartographed by a succession of new digital techniques and applications. With the smartphone, if not before, communication coincides with control. Zygmunt Bauman describes how once solid and fixed surveillance relationships would become increasingly more flexible and the mobile, and would expand into areas of life in which they previously played only a marginal role or no role at all. Bauman adopts Deleuze's rhizomatics to show that surveillance in controlled societies does not grow in a tree-like and ordered way, but spreads rhizome fashion. The new forms of surveillance would depend on data processing and would have long since left the framework of the disciplining discourses described by Foucault. They affected a new transparency, in which not only state citizens as such, but every human being in all areas of everyday life, could be, continuously monitored, observed, tested, evaluated, judged, and sorted into categories. In a fully one-sided way. While every detail of our everyday life is becoming ever more transparent to the organizations that observe us, their activities are increasingly opaque to us. The power relationships of today, on the other hand, are, according to Bauman, post-panoptic. Electronic technologies which are, 
made use of, by power in the rapidly changing and mobile organizations of our present day, make solid walls and windows largely superfluous, apart from windows and firewalls, of course, they're virtual phantoms. Additionally, they enable very different forms of domination, not only do these no longer have any clear connection to prisons, they are also frequently characterized by being exceptionally flexible and, in the media and shopping, actually frequently go hand in hand with fun and entertainment. So, in there we're gonna come to, let's say, the topic I was basically where everything started and I was really interested in is how these digital tools, how Google Maps and yeah, how this, um, this new way to see maps have shaped um, the way how we work in the city, how we um, yeah, how we, how we, basically how we use this tool to interact with other actors um, in the city or how we also, um, how it's also basically shaping the way how we, we, we gonna travel, for example. So Google Maps started in, um, I think, 2005, followed by, by Street View. And um, these maps have, I would say, fundamentally changed our understanding how we read maps, right? I guess when you ask somebody, think about a map, I would say that for most of the people, what power in their mind is more like a virtual map, like the ones which is um, defined by Google. So we could say that um, aesthetically wise, they're also defining in a way like how maps look like these days. And um, of course they have like little in common with um, with analog printed maps. So they are like sc uh, scrollable, uh, zoomable and also searchable. And so I would say that since 2005, with the advance of it, um, a lot of, let's say, things change how we understand maps and how we read them. I mean, of course, it's quite obvious that one of the benefits of digital maps is that um, they can implement data there, which means that they are, can somehow act as a real-time map, right? And that's probably also one of the negative sides of printed maps, because you have to imagine, let's say, you have like a, whatever, like a, big map, uh, like a huge map uh, printed um, of, of Berlin in the moment when you print it, it's actually already outdated, right? Because the, the landscape, the area around us is changing, it's dynamic like a river. And in that moment when you print or when you create something like this, then you cannot, you can actually never say that, that this map is the, is the current state. So it means that maps can help for, can be helpful for us, but can be up for, for a short period of time, but can also limit the use of, of these maps, especially when they are printed. And I think that the, the, the main goal of Google Maps is to overcome this state and to say like, okay, here, look, right now we are creating a tool that doesn't come with this kind of outdated uh, situation anymore. It's, it's, it's kind of a representing of the, of the, of the world around us, a real, real time representing of the world around us. Um, so unfortunately, as uh, technology likes us, and sometimes it doesn't like us, um, the codec didn't work um, for the presentation. So here I would like to show you the Google Maps hacks, maybe also for the one. Who doesn't know it? So yes. In the beginning of this year, um, in February, um, there was the um, 15th birthday of Google Maps. And uh, one week before the birthday, I, was, um, pub I, I published uh, this project on Twitter. And um, what the project is about, so what you see is um, there's a guy walking the street of Berlin with a um, um, red head, um, wagon, and in this wagon, there, there are 99 smartphones. Um, on the smartphones, there are most, I mean, actually all of them, there are Android smartphones. And uh, what's happening is that um, when you're walking alongside the street, forward, backward, and sometimes also a bit um, faster, sometimes a bit slower, then 
um, is generate generate some virtual traffic on Google Maps, and this had the effect in that moment that people which are using Google Maps navigation system are being linked around um, around me or about this guy, and after a while you could literally say that, see that um, you could literally also feel it that suddenly the the, the, the street was getting um, empty and empty of cars, and this was quite interesting to see like how such a huge impact these navigation systems and especially the maps has on our um or let's say um yeah way how we how we how we use them but also in a way like how people are uh, let's say traveling and, and um, navigating the system in the city in, yeah, in the city and um well this kind of you know slow faster movement as i mentioned it was also some kind of a trick to to um, think about like how could the algorithm um, read uh, let's say 99 um, cars in a way as a traffic jam so with this action we were trying to also generate some kind of uh, stop and go traffic and um, yeah i would say the 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 um, the hack, or let's say the performance itself, I got the idea at the first of my dem May demonstration in Berlin, where I saw a lot of people um, working um, alongside the street, especially in Kreuzberg. And in that time, I had to look at my smartphone, and I realized that um, Google was showing a lot of like a huge virtual traffic uh, at around Kreuzberg. But in fact, there was no um, car driving at all in the city or in this place there. Um, so and it was quite clear to me that they are tracking um, those smartphones of the people and then they are creating the virtual traffic out of it. And I was asking myself, okay, how can I create something similar to this? And then, of course, I mean, it was clear that I, I just need um, smartphones and, and not the people for this for to do this uh, to do a similar um, effect. And um, yeah, I mean, then the journey began, like how to get the smartphones and so on and. Um, but this was quite hard in a way at the beginning because I thought, okay, like, is there, you know, there must be some kind of secondhand um, smartphones in, let's say, companies at airports and so on, airports and so on, because all the employees they're getting smartphones like every three years, four years. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't get any, let's say, response um, from them to say like, yeah, of course you can use it here for something like this. And then I came up with the idea, okay, maybe out of Let's say if I want to generate something like this, I could also make another performance out of it, of, out of it to ask, let's say, friends if they are willing to give me their smartphone for one day, and if they basically can live without their smartphone for one day, and I'm going to use their smartphones for this hack. And um, this was actually interesting to me that most people were first of all like, yeah, okay, I can, let's see how how it works, and but um, then. After a while, they said like, okay, okay, let's, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you the smartphone, and then we can, uh, let's do it, and then I will, we will see if, if I can survive the smartphone for one day. Um, of course, I don't have 99 friends, so I also got um, smartphones so, from some uh, official smartphone suppliers, and yeah, and then basically, uh, I had all the smartphones for one day, did the, did the performance, and it was after after one hour of working inside the screen, it was in a way quite obvious that this kind of performance or this kind of hack would work. Um, let me quickly jump out of the presentation because I would like to give you also another. Um, Yeah, thank you very much. That was super interesting. I think actually there could be a, a future similar workshop to how we're working today on seeing how YouTube shows different things in the future, how YouTube or how Google Maps shows you different routes. That's quite scary development. Um, yeah, I would like to just ask you one question before we open up to the audience. And I'm sure you get this question quite a lot, but um, do you know if anything was changed by Google in their algorithm or their software after you uh, did this performance or was there any change or are we still able to do this hack? I mean, there, it's, it's definitely possible there are already some, some uh, let's say, copycats out there. So there are YouTube videos where people are generating a similar virtual traffic. I mean, the thing is that uh, Google spokesperson said like, yeah, there are, you know, no matter what, what's in the city, if it's like a whatever a car, camel, uh, or a person on a camel or something else, they are trying to track everything. 
And there was another sentence that they are also happy about that, you know, people make you aware of such kind of bugs and they are still trying to filter these kind of events out. So for sure I, gonna, I will do, um, um, basically I will test the system, I don't know, maybe a half year or a year and then figure out if it still works or not. But I have the feeling it's going to be quite hard for them to, to filter something like this. Yeah. yeah, I guess something will always be possible to hack it. Yeah. yeah. Great, so are there any questions from our audience? We still have a bit of time before we start with the works. So, um, just a technical uh, question about the act you have done on uh, Google uh, Maps. Um, you, the 99 um, cell phone should be on Google, like, or just uh, with GPS activated, or? Um, yeah, exactly, so yeah, you have to activate, I mean, of course, right, there, there are three, three different ways um, how smartphones can be tracked. So I would say the most accurate is GPS, then you have, let's like, say, the network, um, location system which works over um, antennas in the city it's like a triangulation calculation and then you have wi-fi and um, i enabled all, all three of them um, and then the thing is also important to mention is that it didn't ha i didn't have to open google maps on the smartphone it was literally just um, android um, i mean probably it works better when you have google um, maps running as an application on the smartphone but um, for sure they are also tracking you when you don't have it um, running Google Maps. I think there was another question here in the front. Thanks for the talk, it was really, that was really interesting. And I've got a question, you, you were mentioning copycats or copy kids. Yeah. Uh, anything interesting you've seen there c coming up on YouTube, people you know, elaborating on your idea and maybe you know giving you a new angle on, on what you what you started there um i mean of course there there had been some people mentioned like um i mean i got a lot of let, let me think i got some kind of ideas where people thought okay it could be interesting to use it also in another way um i mean not from the guys from youtube they are literally were trying to um well you know to simulate that but of course right now, you have to like this, i mean the google alg algorithms also learning um let's say that when there's a traffic on uh, going on every week on the same time then after a while it will also predict that in a way and then i think people came up with the idea okay you know when i gonna do that let's say three four times then will it be possible for the next time the street will be empty and then i have basically you know when i cycle from a to b then the street will be uh, to my when i go to work for example then the street will be empty this kind of um, ideas came up um, during the conversation or let's say in the in the comments might be interesting to see i mean also by the way that's i think also important to mention um, i mean as an artist i always try to or that's my understanding i really try to um, come up with some easy let's say um, um, narratives to, um, for 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 by the audience to understand like how this technology works right and this was for me to use the smartphones a pretty let's say understandable um, easy to read way but i also have to mention that there are multiple ways to simulate something like this i mean buzzwords are you know gps spooing um, as we know it from um, pokemon go as well like how they are using it um, but of course you can also use um, let's say trick the google api there are already some uh, papers out there where people did it like five years ago um, but i would say for 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 an audience which is not so familiar with technology let's say hard to read that or to understand that and then i think that's um, probably also the reason why the 99 smartphones got a lot of attention because it was easy easier to read The 2016 summer's fashionable phenomenon was the location-based app Pokemon Go, a project by the Nintendo video games company and former internal Google startup Niantic, headed by the Google Earth inventor John Hanker. 
This summer, this augmented reality app led to hysterical mass movements, caused lethal accidents, but, first and foremost, had users hooked catching monsters, like here in the video in Taiwan. Pokemon Go gamifies the real urban space, making it a virtual arena. It is based on a modified Google map. Pokemon Go brought users into places of the disciplinary society declared by authorities to be unsuitable places to play, such as prisons, schools, hospitals, barracks and military training areas, or former concentration camps. Owners of matured Pokemons virtually occupied contested territories and defended them against other players, obliging them to move and cover ground. Pokemon Go has entered tech history as the most profitable smartphone game of all time, with a daily take of over 2 million US dollars from so-called in-app purchases. More profitable, although it cannot be recorded in numbers, is the switching on of location sharing, the tracking of the mass body, the inscribing of its serpentine movements on Google Maps. Movement data allows the coordinates of the base map to be improved. Google analyzes the individual surroundings of users based on GPS and geodata. Additionally, the map steers users in a targeted way. In Japan, it steered them to fast food restaurants, where a so-called poke stop was inscribed into the map in front of every McDonald's branch. With Pokemon Go, Google dramatically shows that it is able to steer large currents of customers, and how it can function as an instrument of social control through virtual techniques of marketing. With this game, Google is testing something that will probably be commonplace for all sorts of maps soon. The recipe for Pokemon Go's success lies with the individual play and user experience. It will be interesting to see how the knowledge gained from this will translate into the everyday functions of the normal individual Google map, with the goal of working towards a still more efficient control situation. Pokemon Go can be described as a map monster with a liberal appearance, Inscribed into Pokemon Go are the codes of individual control material. Deleuze writes in the postscript that the serpent is the animal of the societies of control. The serpent is conquering space through movement. The coils of the serpent, of a snake are even more complex. In the context of Pokemon Go, Deleuze's serpent looks like Pikachu. Thank you.